Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so I want to talk to you a little bit tonight. It might sound like I'm, I'm beating the same drum a little bit, but I, I need to just say some things that are really on my, uh, on my heart and in my spirit, and then I'm, I'm hoping beyond this to say some things that are stirring in my heart about faith. Um, but tonight, I, uh, I want to talk to you about new wineskins. And uh, I want to read you something that Chris sent me today that I think is a good foundation just to just to then make some comments out of, and uh, this, this is written by uh, Father Richard Raw, who uh, I have a lot of time for Richard Raw. He's uh, got a wonderful insight on, um, on Scripture and life and truth and God. So, but you see what I, uh, where we're going with it as I read it. Okay. The last great formal persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire ended in AD 303. Ten years later, Christianity was legalized by Constantine I. After this structural change, Christianity increasingly accepted and even defended the dominant social order, especially concerning war and money. <clears throat> Morality became individualized and largely sexual. The church slowly lost its free and alternative vantage point. Texts written in the hundred years preceding 313 show it was unthinkable that a Christian would fight in the army, as the army was killing Christians. By the year 400, the entire army had become Christian, and they were now killing pagans. Before AD 313, the church was on the bottom of society, which is the privileged vantage point for understanding the liberating power of the gospel for both the individual and for society. Overnight, the church moved from the bottom to the top, Literally, from the catacombs to the basilicas. The Roman basilicas were large buildings for court and other public assembly, and they became Christian worship spaces. The Christian church became the established religion of the empire and started reading the gospel from the position of maintaining power and social order instead of experiencing the profound power of powerlessness that Jesus revealed. In a sense, Christianity almost became a different religion. This shift would be similar to reversing the first of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to seek power instead of admitting powerlessness. In this paradigm, only the winners win, whereas the true gospel has everyone winning. Calling this power spiritual and framing success as moral perfection made this position all the more seductive to the ego and all the more disguised. The failing Roman Empire needed an emperor, and Jesus was used to fill the power gap, making much of his teaching literally incomprehensible and unhearable, even by good people. The relationships of the Trinity were largely lost as the very shape of God, the Father, became angry and distant. Jesus became the needed organizing principle, and for all practical and dynamic purposes, the Holy Spirit was forgotten. An imperial system needs law and order and clear belonging systems more than it wants mercy or meekness or transformation. By the grace of God, saints and holy ones of every century and in every denomination and monastery still got the point, but only if they were willing to go through painful descent, which Catholics call the way of the cross. Jesus called it the sign of Jonah. Augustine called it the paschal mystery. And the Apostles' Creed called it the descent into hell. Without these journeys, there's something essential you simply don't understand about the very nature of God and the nature of your own soul. You try to read reality from the side of power instead of powerlessness, despite the fact that God has told us through the image of the crucified that vulnerability and powerlessness is the way to true spiritual power. But Christians made a jeweled logo and decoration of the cross when it is supposed to be a shocking strategic plan charting the inevitable path of full transformation into God. That's quite a statement, isn't it? 
Um, I really fear sometimes that we miss the full intent and extent of Jesus' statements towards and regarding the religious elite, which were, if you know anything about it, let's face it, pretty brutal. Now, of course, we need to ask, what, what do we mean by religious elite? Because this is not about, you know, bashing religion or bashing any group of religion, but within the context, there is something that is the religious elite. How do you decide who are the religious elite in today's world, in the church? Let me tell you why it was a bit brutal. Matthew 23 summarizes it this way in verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. This is the religious elite. You hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to do, which being interpreted as you have screwed up the gospel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over the land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. That's, that's a pretty damning statement about some of our methods of church growth, isn't it? Verse 23, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Verse 27, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So in Jesus' world, he was pointing at the people who appeared to have all the attributes of good God, being good God-fearing followers. See, it's easy to read that and think that he was pointing out a bunch of people who you would readily recognize as being a problem, but actually the opposite was true, because if you were to analyze the lives of these people who Jesus was talking about, they were faithful tithe payers. They didn't just give a tenth of their money, they gave a tenth of everything that grew in their garden or in their herb pot. And they prayed consistently. They were people who fasted. They were people who not only read the scriptures, but could quote the scriptures verbatim from memory, even against Jesus. Imagine that, quoting scriptures against Jesus to prove that he was not who he said he was, that he was not there to do what he said he would do, using scripture to tear down what was a revelation of the true gospel. So these people, to most of us, on the outward, would look to be the, exactly the kind of people that God would choose to build this new kingdom, and yet Jesus saved all his harshest words for those people. You cannot find within the context of the gospels anywhere where Jesus isolated a, and let's use the phrase used, sinner, and condemned that sinner or criticized that sinner for their sin because he didn't see them as sinners, he saw them as people with a sickness that needed to be healed, not a crime that had to be punished. And so grace and mercy and justice flowed to those people. But for the religious elite, those who looked as though they had got it all right and their ducks in order, Jesus had very severe words. Harsh words directed at twisted people who, in essence, were guilty of distorting the very essence of who God really is and thereby the content of the message, all while dressing it in scripture and theology. The greatest mask to the distortion of the gospel is not atheism. 
Because atheism is actually an honesty about the gospel. The greatest mask to the distortion of the gospel is religion. And even more so, the religious elite. Because it's so easy for us to say, we're not religious, we're in relationship with God. Well, however you want to put it, those of us who are of streams that say it's not a religion, it's a relationship, can be and are very often just as guilty of the same hypocritical, pharisaical viewpoint that is, is, is brought to the fore here and criticized by Jesus because he has a problem with what they are doing to the message. So he says, you'll go across land and sea to make a disciple of your stuff, but you turn them into twice the sons of hell that you are. Now this is gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who didn't talk about condemnation to sinners, but had all these words for maybe people like you and me, maybe, maybe people like me, The question I have to ask is, in my perception of the gospel, in my perception of Christianity, in my perception of my belief, have I slipped into becoming one of those that Jesus would deem to be the religious elite? Challenging, isn't it? And and very much that fact about dressing it in scripture and theology. It's very interesting when you've been around as long as I've been around that whatever point you might raise about God, about Jesus, about the cross, about end times, about anything, somebody's always got a scripture and a theology to trump your scripture and theology. I've started using a lot more rationality in the context of scripture because you can win an argument but lose the person when actually we want to win people. And I also want to be one to the truth wherever it needs to be found. So what is evident is that their brand of believing tended towards a self-promoting, self-righteous vanity rather than humility. Um, I've been there, I'll be honest with you. I, um, I was younger than I am now at one time in my life. And uh, I was a lot more ambitious, and uh, in those times I had to admit that, that there's kind of something inside of you that you wanted to be around certain people, you wanted to be able to throw certain names into the conversation, and I knew some pretty significant people, particularly in the US, and, uh, and was pretty close to some of those people. And uh, I look back now and I have to say, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Um, I thought it was about expanding the kingdom, but what it was more about, in all honesty, uh, was about self-promotion and vanity and to a great degree self-righteousness of value being found because of who you knew in the context of people rather than who you knew in the context of the Father. And uh, there wasn't a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, let's get lower so we can get higher. There was a lot of let's get higher so we can get even higher than we are, and um, again, I've got to be careful because we can also be guilty of the same, but I sometimes wonder how much of our systems Jesus would criticize because when you look at them, how much of it, even in the church context, is self-promoting, self-righteous, and vanity rather than humility. I know all the buzzwords. I know what to put out on social media to look successful. I just know just like people are talking now about Theresa May and whatever it, what's her phrase about a stable something government. A great buzzword if you want to find some notoriety out there, multi-site. That'll lift your name like you would not believe. Just drop the multi-site thing about your church. What I'm trying to say is not that that is a problem in the context of where it really happens, but the question is, in our perception of the kingdom of God, how much is self-promotion, self-righteousness, and vanity rather than humility? Because he declared those people to be a menace rather than a help. And at this stage of my life, I don't want to be a menace to the kingdom of God. I want to be a help to the kingdom of God. I don't want to be like these guys who with all their prayers and scripture knowledge actually were not pushing the kingdom that was the kingdom of Jesus but were pushing empire and the kingdoms of men and had a distorted understanding of what the whole thing was all about. 
So, I said that because yesterday was a sobering day here at The Rock. Um, we had a wedding. We had the wedding of Amy Hamilton and Zach Taylor, who's not his real name, but that's who Zach goes under. And he's really Andrew Buttle, but I can understand why he'd want to be called Zach Taylor. And it was funny that when his name was read out, how there was a snicker went right across the audience like, what a stupid name, <laughs> which you can understand why Zach said, don't call me Andrew, call me Zach. But as we were here in, uh, in the, what? What are you laughing at? All right. Control yourself. Settle down, settle down. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about what I talked to, about tonight is because as I was here yesterday and looked at that, I can honestly say something triggered in me and I thought, this is the kind of church that I want to pastor. Now, that's no disrespect to you. I love you guys very much and I appreciate you. We've walked a wonderful journey together. But I hope also it would be the kind of church that you all would want to embrace and be part of. My big question is, in the context of that, how do we do it? That becomes the challenge then. But I honestly knew in my heart this is the kind of church that I want to pastor. I remember something being said, uh, Chris picked up, or Chris said some years ago that was very challenging and I took it all around the world and, and people have grabbed on it. That could it be possible that when God looks at the world, he wishes it was the church? And that when he looks at the church, he wishes that was the world? Because what he sees in the world is more like what he wants to see in the church than what he sees in the church. And he would rather that what he sees in the church sometimes be what's the world and what's happening in the world be what's the church. And as I saw this yesterday, and as we went along and talked to these people and we met these people, there was a sense of an authenticity and a genuineness that warts and all was coming out that very often you do not experience in the context of the church community because very often we can be a bit like those Pharisees and hypocrites who wear the mask and cover up and all kinds of stuff's going on in our lives but we just look so amazing and so lovely. But here there was a sense of honesty and um, it was very interesting that, that um, you know, and I wish you could have heard it, Amy's... Amy's new husband, Zach, uh, his speech at the reception. Um, we, I've been to many receptions. I've been to receptions where we've served, you know, Christian families and Christian believers, and you get the little obligatory, you know, we just like to thank The Rock and Anthony Chris, you know, for the building and what they've done today. You know, that's the obligatory kindness of... Um, Zach must have spoke for five minutes very genuinely, very, very emotionally about this place, about what he encountered when he came with Amy, about his own personal view of life, about where he stands and honestly what he thinks about life. And he would not classify himself as a Christian, but his words about the Rock of York were absolutely priceless. And I thought, Jesus, give us the Zacks and his friends and this crowd, because that's the church I want to pastor. I don't want to build just another representation of, of Christian practice that's just mostly like everything else, but just slightly different, because very often it's competitive, and we need to be honest, it gets competitive. Who's got the best music? Who's got the best program? Who feeds the most students? Who gives the most for free? Who can get the most jobs done? And they're all valid and all useful, but I know I'm mixing this circle. I know it extremely well, and very often there is a kind of a competitiveness that very often what we are doing is we are servicing ourselves. And we are moving our resources around and convincing ourselves of stuff that's happening that's not really happening. This is the church that I would like to pastor, and I'd like to feel that we together can move forward for that. Jesus shared this enduring principle for change. I believe the wisdom of which still holds sure today for both the individual 
and the church. And it's on the slide that we had at the beginning, which I, I want to get up there for you. There's a little bit before that that I'm going to read, won't be there, but the last bit that I want to talk about is on the slide. And here it goes from Luke chapter 5, verse 36. He, Jesus, told them this parable. No one... Sounds like I want to start the Monty Python thing. No one... <laughs> right? Is to throw a stone until I blow this whistle. the movies you guys watch. Jesus told them this parable, no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it onto an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. Now, I'd like to put four words in there to, to help us understand what, how pressured this point is with Jesus. No one, unless they are stupid... Tears a patch from a new garment. That was really the implication of the message. No one, unless they are stupid, tears a patch of new cloth from, from a new garment and sews it onto an old one, because if he does, he will have torn the new garment and the patch will, from the new will not match the old. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily match in color. It means that you won't fix the problem because the, the quality of the two garments are different and you'll make the problem worse. Verse 37, which is where we are on the screen. And no one, unless they are stupid, pours new wine into old wineskins. Now, you understand wine was transported in wineskin in those days. We haven't really invented glass yet. We don't have glass bottles. So wineskins are the way that we transport wine. No one, unless they are stupid, pours new wine into old wineskins. For if he does, the new wine will burst the skins... The wine will run out, and the wineskin will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins, and no one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. Let's leave verse 39 till the end. Let's talk about this principle. Wine in wineskins. Why would old wineskins not be suitable for new wine? Well, because wine in the wineskins ferments, and as it ferments, it lets off gas, and the gas stretches the wineskin, and when the wineskin's stretched, it becomes brittle. So you don't put new wine in old wineskins. So here's the point Jesus is making from these two parables. You cannot make two incompatible things compatible. And we're often trying to do it in practice, in behavior, in belief, in doctrine. Trying to put them together causes immense frustration to all concerned. I apologize. The occurring movement will expose the patches. Or in other words, the shrinkage of the new patch and the old patch are different. So, so as they begin to shrink and move, the new patch tears away from the old patch. And in one of the other Gospels, it says, and you make the tear worse. You make the garment more ruined than it was by trying to fix it by putting something incompatible, the new, onto something that is old. The two are incompatible. So the occurring movement will expose the patches. And in the context of the wineskins, the inevitable pressures will expose the wineskin. So the pressures of putting new wine into an old skin will expose the frailty and the brittleness of the old wineskin, which was perfectly good and perfectly suitable and perfectly capable of the wine that it had in it before. Right? It's not a criticism of the wineskin, it's just that the wineskin now is not capable of expanding in order to contain the new. If you're going to put new wine in, you better make a new wineskin to put it in. That is, if you don't want to lose it all. And here's the sobering story. He said, if you are stupid enough to try to put the new wine in an old wineskin, the wineskin will burst, and you will lose both the skin and the wine. You will lose it all if you make this critical mistake 
of trying to put new wine into an old wineskin. This has been relevant throughout the history of the church at large, and it's relevant in the context of churches within the picture at large. It's relevant in the context of this church and we as people. And so we better take note and not be stupid. When you have stretched an existing wineskin as far as it will go, it must be replaced with the new one or it will burst. So let's ask a practical question. Most of us are family here. Have we stretched this wineskin as far as it will go? Is there a danger that it will burst unless we replace it with a new one that is able to contain and carry the wine of the new gift, the new anointing, the new message, the new presence that comes to us. Now, the story was with Jesus to the existing community who had sought to follow the old covenant as far as they understood it. If you try to fit me and what I'm saying now into this and what you've believed then, you are going to destroy it and you will lose me. And we could have a long conversation about the history of the Jewish nation in the context of that. It's very relevant for us today. Be mindful of the pressures and tensions that are being created in all directions. When you put new wine into a wineskin, the pressures occur in all directions, okay? It's not just like, oh, there's one little niggle here, we've got some real pressure going on there. The pressure occurs uniformly across the wineskin. So there is no escape from the pressure. There is no way of avoiding what the new wine causes and creates within the wineskin. It is going to stretch it. We just better make sure that it's capable of the stretching because it's going to happen on every front, on every direction, in everything, through practice, through procedures, through function, through belief, through doctrine, through presentation, through fellowship, through everything we do, the pressure will go right across it. All because of the new wine. And all that is happening is screaming out for a new wineskin. It's saying, if it could talk, I can't take this anymore. Need a new wineskin. If we are going to get this to the people, we need a new wineskin. Now Luke adds a strange little verse in there which I said I would talk about, which I am, verse 39. He's the only one of the three Gospels that mention these parables that puts this verse in, and he says, And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for he says the old is better. It's interesting that Luke should feel it's important to record this little verse in the context of the parable, but he, as the non-Jewish writer among the gospel writers, He's addressing an issue that I believe he had recognized in talking to the Jewish people from whom he was getting the account that Luke was writing down. He picked something up. And so Luke, the non-Jew, is onto that like a rash. I need to mention this because it's important. And so he adds this extra verse where he says, no one after drinking the old wine wants the new. Now I want you to notice, not because... God says the old is better. Did you catch that? Because he says, who? The one who's drunk the old wine says, hey, the old is better. Which means there'll always be those who say, I wanted what we had. I wanted to stick with what we'd got. The challenge then is that you're not really a new wine person but you can become one. Because he says nobody puts old wine, new wine in an old wineskin, but he puts new wine in a new wineskin. You can be a new wineskin. Every one of us can be a new wineskin. That's part of the power of resurrection, that we can come through a death into a resurrection that gives us something more glorified so that we can receive, access, work with, flow within the flow of that new wine and understand what it means in our life. And that's the problem with the old. 
I read something online, some dear, dear pastor was saying, you know, what Jesus said is that we need to embrace the old because the old will always have its place. I'm like, it, that is a serious lesson in missing the point. It's a serious lesson in not reading what the parable is saying before. No one puts a new patch on an old garment. No one puts new wine in an old wineskin. It's not a justification for saying that we should just still keep the old because the old is really good. It's saying what you will say as a person is the old is better because that's what you're familiar with and that's what you're comfortable with and you have stretched to accommodate the old wine and now you feel comfortable and settled and satisfied but God was saying Jesus was new wine to the world. He keeps sending new wine to the world. Therefore, we can never become settled, but we will be comfortable while ever we only contain the old wine. And the sad thing is we'll go looking for old wine that stopped fermenting. When Jesus' message was no one, unless they're stupid, tries to put new wine in an old wineskin, but it wasn't so get rid of that. It's I want you to be new wineskins. So that what I'm doing in you will expand you, it will stretch you, it will make you, and then when you begin to pour out, you'll bring this new wine that is the wine of the Spirit that I think we had a new wine moment yesterday. So are you willing to be a new wineskin? Are you willing to become one? Remember, the problem with new wine is that you cannot, you cannot control or define what that new wine will do within the context of the wineskin. The wine has a life of its own. When the wine's poured in, you, you, the wine now has a, a life of its own. And it will do what it does. It's just that if you're not prepared for what it does, the likelihood is you'll either go back to the old wine or you'll try to make it work in an old context and then you'll wonder why everything's falling apart and you've got no joy and you've got no peace and you've got no satisfaction because the skin burst and the wine poured out because we didn't listen. So I want you to be a no one. I want you to be a no one. To be willing to be a no one. The no one who refuses to put new wine in an old wineskin. The no one who takes the lower position. The low one who comes in humility. The low one who's not part of some spiritual elite because of what we think we learned and what we think we know and what we think that we have done. The no one. We become the no ones. I want to be a no one because no one puts new wine in old wineskins because he knows they'll burst. But that no one makes sure new wine goes into new wineskins. We individually and personally are wineskins into which God by his spirit is pouring. We have to decide whether we are going to be open to new wine or just stuck in the old. We as a body are a wineskin. We have to be open for the new wine to come in knowing that all that it does with us will make that wine sweeter and greater and better. There's one more principle about, about new wine in the context of the culture. New wine was meant for drinking. It wasn't meant for preserving. It wasn't meant for keeping. You didn't have wine cellars then where you would go and store your wine and I want to bring out a, you know, a... a, a, a uh, a 05 BC vintage, you know, 30 years later. That was not the point. The understanding was this wineskin is dispensable because the, the wineskin is not the point. The wine is the point. The message is the point. The word is the point. The revelation is the point. The spirit is the point. The wineskin is dispensable. We're not here to preserve church structures or our individual egos. We are here to understand the wine is the point. So therefore I submit to that. But the miracle being because of resurrection, when I submit to that, I don't die, I live. When I submit to that, I'm not bound, I'm set free. I am not entombed but I'm resurrected. And I believe that if we can catch this, we step into a new era. 
a new time individually, personally, corporately as a church that I long for and I dream about and I want for me also that I'll be a new wineskin so that the new wine can be in me and that then when I pour out this wine for the drinking, it's because we hasn't been lost along the way, but it's fresh to the people who need it. And that is the kind of church yesterday that I want, that I want you to want, and that we are believing that God will absolutely give us as he draws those people, but it's going to happen as we come with new wine. The new wine was what touched the people talking to them last night. There was a way of touching them, and God is helping us to get there. So I invite you on this journey, I invite you as yourself to say, Lord, help me to be the no one tries to put the new patch on the old garment, the new wine in the old wineskin. I want to be that no one and in humility for you to fill me and expand me and make me a vehicle for your blessing, for your word, for your for your revelation to this generation in Jesus' name. All right, let's pray. Father, we just deliver this to you, ask you to help us. I pray for every heart, pray for every person, for all our intention. All we want to do is please you because we believe you're amazing and we thank you for the gospel that you have given us, that it is a more beautiful gospel than we ever imagined and that that's where you have been bringing us in this revelation. We believe in a more beautiful gospel and we want to be the wineskins that pour that out to the world in in unrestricted measure as we become those people that you need. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, enjoy a cup of tea, coffee, whatever, and uh, we'll see you later. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.